Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you have ever read the life of Mary of Egypt? This is something that is an absolute jewel. We have studied now the life, or the, the, uh, well, the life and martyrdom of St. Ignatius, who died in about 117, was martyred in 117 in Rome. We have studied the martyrdom of St. Polycarp, who was martyred in about 155 in Smyrna in Asia Minor. These give us, in a sense, a taste of the life of the apostolic church. That in a sense, we, we're, we're looking at the bridge which crosses the gap between Scripture and that church as the, as the full oak tree that we, we find, in a sense, at the Council of Nicaea and beyond. But I hope that you've started to uh, see and hear that actually there is no gap. That the very issues that John the Apostle was battling against and writing his letters from his exile in Patmos, and writing his epistles when he returned to Ephesus, are the very same issues that Ignatius and Polycarp were dealing with. In fact, they were writing and visiting the very same churches. And it was those churches which were then coming to their, uh, into their aid, coming to their side as great men, as icons of what it meant to be a Christian. And they, these were men who were defending the very same doctrines that were being taught in the sacred scriptures. So those that would claim that in the earliest days these weeds came up and not only mixed with the wheat of the church, but choked the tree and killed it, have really no grounding as we've seen. We now will, will since leave that age of the apostolic fathers because I want you to have also a taste of uh, the life of the church as it continued on into the age of well, the age of the church fathers, leaving the apostolic fathers into the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers. And we have an opportunity tonight then to read the life of Mary of Egypt. Mary of Egypt lived from about 344 to 421. The life of the church had changed, obviously. Primarily, the life of the church changed dramatically in the public sphere uh, at the beginning of the 4th century with the conversion of St. Constantine the Great, the emperor. In 306, Constantine becomes emperor. And in 312, Eusebius tells us that at the, it was at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge when Constantine was preparing for the battle and preparing his army and night had fallen and he went to get a few hours of rest. He closed his eyes and received a vision from God. And the vision was the vision of the cross. And he heard the words, in hoc signo vinces, in this sign, conquer. Constantine awoke. He painted the sign of the cross upon the battle shields of his soldiers. They went to battle and were victorious. Constantine, in a sense, converted to Christ, as we talked about last time. He, didn't, he wasn't baptized till the end of his life, unfortunately. But he accepted Jesus Christ and that became, in a sense, the driving force of his, the rest of his life. It was in this context that the Arian heresy arose, okay, right at about this time. And it was Constantine who called and, and oversaw the Council of Nicaea that dealt with the Arian heresy. It was in the city of Alexandria that Arius was deacon. And it was that city which was the home town, if you will, of Mary of Egypt. As I said, Arius was a deacon, and he denied the divinity of Christ. Okay? He was in some sense a child of the earlier Gnostic heresy, which had engulfed the church early on, which John had battled against. But this heresy had developed, as we saw, into, the, into docetism, this claiming that the appearance of Christ was just that. It was just an appearance, an apparition, if you will. That Christ never truly dwelt in the flesh. And therefore they denied what? 
to taking care of those things of the body. They did, they did not take care of the widows. They refused the Eucharist and so forth. This is what I have heard, Arius says, from those endowed with wisdom. Notice, listen to the pride in this man. This is what I have learned from those endowed with wisdom, prominent men taught by God and skillful in all things. It is in their footsteps I myself walk. I walk like them. I who am so much spoken against and who have suffered so many things for the glory of God. I who have received from God the wisdom and knowledge which I possess. You get a tinge of Gnosticism there. The secret knowledge which he alone has. God has not always been father, Arius claims. There was a moment when he was alone and was not yet father. Later he became so. The son is not from eternity. He came from nothing. I know I've gone after the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses many times, but the Jehovah's Witnesses, look, there's, as Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. It's the same old heresies mixed up, put in a new, new clothing, and represented to man. The devil at work again. And many of you have asked, well, what should we do about these Jehovah's Witnesses at the door? You mean we should turn them away? Not at all. I just want you to be equipped that when you do open that door, you have something valuable to say. Do you know who these people are walking in the door? Okay, we're going to have a talk later on in the summertime um, on, the, uh, on the Jehovah's Witnesses also. In 325, as I said, the Council of Nicaea was convened and condemned Arius, defended orthodoxy, and Constantine stamped his approval. In those days, the emperor confirmed the council. He confirmed the council, but the power of Arius grew Nonetheless, day by day he became more and more influential and his heresy spread further and further into the furthest reaches of the church. St. Jerome says that the world awoke at this time and groaned to find itself Arian. Bishops, priests throughout the world, very few men, very few bishops held on to the true faith, the truth about Jesus Christ, that he was truly the Son of God. As the apostolic church had had fought Gnostic docetism, the church of the 4th century had to fight, in some sense, an opposite heresy. One that now denied, not that Christ had come in the flesh, but that he was only flesh. Although Constantine the Great would be a decisive factor, it was not always for the good. He would soon side with the prevailing winds of the Arian heresy, and side with Arius himself. In fact, it is said that uh, in the last years of his life, he attempted to restore the heretic, Arius, to communion with the church. He brought him in procession, in triumphal procession, into the grand city of Constantinople to be given Holy Communion in Hagia Sophia, the greatest church at that time in Christendom. Luckily, by the grace of God, Arius died the night before as he slept, this story says that his body, he became ill, and his body burst open, and his entrails spilled out onto the ground. And that's how we found him. I want to give you a little taste also of what was going on in Constantine's own life. Bishop Osius, who had been the, the catechist of Constantine, later wrote to Constantine's son, and you get a little taste of the battle that's taking place in the church with this new freedom in 330. I don't even know if I have it up here. Yes, 330. Constantine declares Christianity to be the religion of the empire. He sits at the Council of Nicaea enthroned with the other bishops. And as you know, power tends to corrupt. Okay, And here's what the holy bishop has to say to Constantine's son a few years later. I was a confessor at the first when a persecution arose in the time of your grandfather, Maximian. And if you shall persecute me, I am ready now, too, to endure anything rather than to shed innocent blood and to, bet- and to betray the truth. God has put into your hands the kingdom. To us he has entrusted the affairs of the church. And as he who would steal the empire from you would resist the ordinances of God, so likewise fear on your part lest by taking upon yourself the government of the church you become guilty of a great offense. It is written, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Neither, therefore, is it permitted unto us to exercise an earthly rule, 
nor have you, sire, any authority to burn incense. These things I write unto you out of a concern for your salvation. With regard to the subject of your letters, and we'll talk about St. Athanasius in a minute, with regard to the subject of your letters, this is my determination. I will not unite myself to the Arians. I anathematize their heresy. Neither will I subscribe against Athanasius, whom both we in the Church of the Romans and the whole council pronounced to be guiltless. So you see there what's going on. Yes, the emperor and the empire has converted to Christianity, but now there's a battle with this struggle of who has dominion over what aspect of the church and over what aspect of the state. While the church fought for its life in the face of heresy, the Roman Empire continued to crumble in further moral decay. Dr. Carroll, um, who has graced us with his presence a number of times, describes it in this way. Worst of all was the moral enervation that took away the very qualities of the spirit that alone could have sparked a revival. The social acceptance and constant encouragement of the most depraved pleasures, gazing enthralled at the bloody slaughters in the arena, which we, we've read about in, in the martyrdom of Ignatius, openly indulging every form of sexual vice, frequent attendance at those banquets of monstrous gluttony, which re required the vomitorium, where the guests went to degorge one meal so that they could eat another. While this fight is going on in the empire over, and in the church over heresy, in the social order, a certain decay, moral decay is taking place. Carol continues, For good Christians, only two reactions were now possible. Both occurred widely. One was simply to do one's duty, however infrequently or poorly others were doing theirs. This might sound like something we're dealing with today. Trusting in God and disregarding the imminence of disaster. That was the way of the bishops who became saints, of here and there an honest Christian official, and undoubtedly of many simple laymen unknown to history. The classic example is St. Augustine in his mid-70s, still at his post at Hippo among his frightened flock, while the all-conquering vandals besieged the city. The other way was to humanize very different, indeed appearing to be contradictory, antisocial, escapist, yet in the Christian economy it was profoundly needed and, a, and of enormous benefit. It was the way of the monk, the athlete of Christ. The two ways that Carol talks about here are embodied best by two men that lived at the time in and around Alexandria, the hometown of Mary of Egypt. One, St. Athanasius the Great, who, who earned the title Contra Mundum, against the world, Athanasius against the world. It is said he was one of the few bishops that stood against the prevailing winds of heresy at the time. And the other, St. Anthony of the Desert, St. Anthony the Great, who was the father of monasticism, or has been called the father of monasticism. Both fought Arius and suffered, suffered greatly. In fact, it was St. Athanasius, bishop, Patriarch of Alexandria, we talked when you were over at the Melkite Church about that patriarchal system at the time. Athanasius was one of the patriarchs down there in that patriarchal city in Alexandria. He called Anthony out of the desert to come and help him defend the truth against the prevailing winds of Arius. And we have a fragment of Anthony's text that he wrote. Have no fellowship with the impious Arians, for there is no communion between light and darkness. For you are good Christians, but they, when they say that the Son of the Father, the Word of God, is a created being, differ in naught from the heathen, since they worship that which is created, rather than, the, than God the Creator. But believe that the creation itself is angry with them, because they number the Creator, the Lord of all, by whom all things came into being, with those things which were originated. It was at this time, while the social order fell apart, while heresy was, was, in a sense, rampant, but at the same time, while the early persecutions of the church had, in some sense, subsided. Yes, there had been, a, um, at, at times, a, um, a refiring of the persecutions, but at the same time, also, with the conversion of Constantine, it was legal, finally, to profess your Christian faith. And at this time, many sincere men and women seeking 
to be a witness to Christ, to go all the way as we saw Ignatius with that great desire to go to Rome, to be martyred for Christ. They sought martyrdom, but in a new way. They fled to the deserts, away from the moral depravity of the towns and cities, and at at the same time, toward a certain, what we call today, the white martyrdom. A time to be alone with Christ, they fled to the caves, to the mountains, where no one else would find them, that they might contemplate God Himself for the rest of their life. St. Basil, who wrote at the time to the monks who were fleeing out into the desert, says this, There has come to me a man who says, who says he despises the vanity of this life. He's writing to a monastic community. There has come to me a man who says he despises the vanity of this life, the joys of which he has observed to be ephemeral, passing quickly away and merely furnishing material for eternal fire. I urge you then to place before him all the best practices of exact ascetic observance, and so to introduce him to that life having voluntarily undertaken the contests of piety, subjecting himself to the kind of yoke, living his life in imitation of him who became poor and clothed himself with flesh for us, and so forth. We saw that same, we had a question last time about that desire to be likened to Christ. And so these men fled to the deserts to suffer with Christ as he had suffered. It is in this context that we, that we meet St. Mary of Egypt. In the context of an empire in crisis, converted to Christ, but riddled with heresy, slouching toward Gomorrah and prostrate before the Lord. I want to speak with you just quickly. We're going to meet some things in the text itself which may seem strange to you. They're not so strange to me because as a Melkite Greek Catholic, we share quite a bit in common with the Coptics of Alexandria, the church in Alexandria, and also the church in Jerusalem. Okay, first of all, those that were there at the pre-sanctified gifts liturgy that we attended, remember the prostrations on the floor, similar to what you see the Muslims do. Okay, the Muslims got it from us, as I said then. Okay, they did. This Muslims came, look, Mohammed came around 621, okay? Johnny come lately. He, re- he was out there in the desert, Jewish exiles, Catholic heretics, Christian heretics out there in the desert, and he took those in a sense, a mixture of those two things and put this religion together. So you see taking place within Islam certain things which are very much Christian. An honor of the Virgin Mary, for one. But also practices such as prostrations and things which are, which are proper to the Christian church. Second of all, you'll hear about the Sunday of forgiveness. In the Eastern practice, Lent starts on the Sunday prior to Ash Wednesday. We don't have Ash Wednesday in our tradition. It starts that Sunday prior, and how does it start? As the sun falls upon the day, Vespers is celebrated, the lights are turned off in the church, and we enter into the great fast. To begin the great fast, everybody in the church comes to, the, to an icon of Christ, kisses the icon of Christ, and prostrates to the priest. The priest also prostrates to the person, the faithful. And then the person stands next to the priest and the next person comes up until there is a full ring of people around the entire church prostrating to one another saying, forgive me brother for I am a sinner or forgive me sister for I am a sinner. The two people embrace, give each each other the kiss and this is how we enter into the Lenten period. So you'll hear about this, a practice which goes back to the earliest days of the church and it comes here in the text of Mary of Egypt, which we're going to read. I just want to point out a few other dates of some, uh, some of the things that you're going to hear about. Uh, as I said, the empire is declared Christian in 330. Mary of Egypt is born in 344. Kind of in the aftermath, but also in the midst of, of Arianism taking place in Alexandria. And also in the midst of the life of the great Saint Athanasius, bishop of that city. Saint Sophronius, who lives in the early part of the 7th century, is Bishop of Jerusalem. And why do I bring up St. Sophronius? Because it's St. Sophronius who finally wrote down the life of Mary of Egypt, having received the story from those that had come before, been handed on for 200 years until St. Sophronius wrote it down. The Persians sat Constantinople in 614 and steal the Holy Cross. The cross had been found by St. Helena, 
finding of the cross in 327. Right after the Council of Nicaea, St. Helena, as some have have guessed, to to, uh, make reparation for the sins of her son, who, St. Constantine, who had at that time had turned against his own brother and murdered him and others. It was a very dark time. She went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The pagans had built a temple of Venus over the site of the resurrection. And she went there, tore down the temple, they dug out the place of the resurrection, and there, in a cistern, they found the true cross. How do they know it was the true cross? Because they found the nameplate on the top of the cross, number one. There were three crosses which she found. And she took them out, and a lady, a noble lady who was very ill, she was, at death's door, was brought to her. And the cross was taken, and the three crosses were touched to her until the third cross was touched, and she was healed of her illness. That cross was then stolen by the Persians when they sacked the city in 614. Okay? It was later on, a few years later, that the Muslims would rise, and St. Sophronius himself, Bishop of Jerusalem, would be forced to hand the keys of the city of Jerusalem to the Muslim conquerors. All right, you have the text in front of you. Who does not have a text? Who does not have the copy? A few people. We can help out here. While they're getting that, you're eating some Lenten foods because it is the traditional practice to eat a few dates and a few figs while you're reading the life of Mary of Egypt. Okay, why? Because you'll hear about St. Sophronius doing that very thing. Okay, and so... Uh, I thought I would provide the traditional fare for you. Also, some pomegranate juice, which I thought was fitting, which I wouldn't mind having a little bit of pomegranate juice to keep my voice good. Okay, now, it's a bit longer than what we've been doing. So, uh, bear with it. It's well worth it. Yeah, it'll probably take about 35 minutes, okay? It is good to hide the secret of a king, but it is glorious to reveal and preach the works of God. So said the archangel Raphael, to Tobit when he performed the wonderful healing of his blindness. Actually, not to keep the secret of a king is perilous and a terrible risk, but to be silent about the works of God is a great loss for the soul. And I, says St. Sophronius, in writing the life of St. Mary of Egypt, am afraid to hide the works of God by silence. Remembering the misfortune threatened to the servants who hid his God-given talent in the earth. I am bound to pass on the holy account that has reached me, And let no one think, continued St. Sophronius, that I have had the audacity to write untruth or doubt this great marvel. May I never lie about holy things. If there do happen to be people who after reading this record do not believe it, may the Lord have mercy on them, because reflecting on the weakness of human nature, they consider impossible these wonderful things accomplished by holy people. But now we must begin to tell this most amazing story which has taken place in our generation. There was a certain elder in one of the monasteries of Palestine, a priest of the holy life and speech, who from childhood had been brought up in monastic ways and customs. This elder's name was Zosimus. He had been through the whole course of the ascetical life, and in everything he adhered to the rule once given to him by his tutors as regards spiritual labors. He had also added a good deal himself while laboring to subject his flesh to the will of the Spirit, and he had not failed in his aim. He was so renowned for his spiritual life that many came to him from neighboring monasteries and some even from afar. While doing all this, he never ceased to study the divine scriptures, whether resting, standing, working, or eating food, if the scraps he nibbled could be called food. He incessantly and constantly had a single aim always to sing of God and to practice the teaching of the divine scriptures. Zosimus used to relate how as soon as he was taken from his mother's breast, he he was handed over to the monastery where he went through his training as an ascetic till he reached the age of 53. After that, he began to be tormented with the thought that he was perfect in everything and needed no instruction from anyone, saying to himself mentally, Is there a monk on earth who can be of use to me and show me a kind of asceticism that I have not accomplished? Is there a man to be found in the desert who has surpassed me? Thus thought the elder when suddenly an angel appeared to him and said, Zosimus, valiantly hast thou struggled, as far as this is within the power of man. Valiantly have you gone through the ascetic course, but there is no man who has attained perfection. 
before you lie unknown struggles greater than those you have already accomplished, that you may know how many other ways lead to salvation. Leave your native land like the renowned patriarch Abraham and go to the monastery by the river Jordan. Zosimus did as he was told. He left the monastery in which he had lived from childhood and went to the river Jordan. At last he reached the community to which God had sent him. Having knocked at the door of the monastery, he told the monk who was the porter who he was, and the porter told the abbot. On being admitted to the abbot's presence, Zosimus made the usual monastic prostration and prayer. Seeing that he was a monk, the abbot asked, Where do you come from, brother, and why have you come to us poor old men? Zosimus replied, There is no need to speak about where I have come from, but I have come, Father, seeking spiritual profit, for I have heard great things about your skill in leading souls to God. Brother, the abbot said to him, Only God can heal the infirmity of the soul. May he teach you and us his divine ways and guide us. But as it is the love of Christ that has moved you to visit us poor old men, then stay with us if that is why you have come. May the good shepherd who laid down his life for our salvation fill us all with the grace of the Holy Spirit. After this, Zosimus bowed to the abbot and asked for his prayers and blessings and stayed in the monastery. There he saw elders proficient, both in action and the contemplation of God, a flame in spirit and working for the Lord. They sang incessantly. They stood in prayer all night. Work was ever in their hands and psalms on their lips. Never an idle word was heard among them. They knew nothing about acquiring temporal goods or the cares of life. But they had one desire to become in body like corpses. Their constant food was the word of God, and they sustained their bodies on bread and water, as much as their love for God allowed them. Seeing this, Zosimus was greatly edified and prepared for the struggle that lay before him. Many days passed, and the time drew near when all Christians fast and prepare themselves to worship the divine passion and resurrection of Christ. The monastery gates were kept always locked and only opened when one of the community was sent out on some errand. It was a desert place, not only unvisited by people of the world, but even unknown to them. There was a rule in that monastery, which was the reason why God brought Zosimus there. At the beginning of the great fast on Forgiveness Sunday, the priest celebrated the Holy Liturgy and all partook of the Holy Body and Blood of Christ. After the liturgy, they went to the refectory and would eat a little Lenten food. Then all gathered in the church, and after praying earnestly with prostrations, the elders kissed one another and asked forgiveness. And each made a prostration to the abbot and asked his blessing and prayers for the struggle that lay before them. After this, the gates of the monastery were thrown open, and seeing the Lord is my light and my Savior, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defender of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And the rest of that psalm all went out into the desert and crossed the river Jordan. Only one or two brothers were left in the monastery, not to guard the property, for there was nothing to rob, but so as not to leave the church without divine service. Each took with him as much as he could or wanted in the way of food, according to the needs of his body. One would take a little bread, another some figs, another dates or wheat soaked in water. And some took nothing but their own body covered with rags and fed when nature forced them to it on the plants that grew in the desert. After crossing the Jordan, they all scattered far and wide in different directions, and this was the rule of life they had, and which they all observed, neither to talk to one another nor to know how each one lived and fasted. If they did happen to catch sight of one another, they went to another part of the country, living alone and always singing to God, and at a definite time eating a very small quantity of food. In this way they spent the whole of the fast and used to return to the monastery a week before the resurrection of Christ on Palm Sunday. Each one returned having his own conscience as a witness of his labor, and no one asked another how he had spent his time in the desert. Such were the rules of the monastery. Every one of them, while in the desert, struggled with himself before the judge of the struggle, God, not seeking to please men and fast before the eyes of all. For what is done for the sake of men to win, the praise, to win praise and honor is not only useless to the one who does it, but sometimes the cause of great punishment." Zosimus did the same as all, and he went far, far into the desert with a secret hope of finding some father who might be living there and who might be able to satisfy his thirst and longing. And he wandered on tirelessly, as if hurrying on to some definite place. He had already walked for twenty days, and when the sixth hour came, he stopped and turned to the east. He began to sing the sixth hour and recite the customary prayers. He used to break his journey thus, 
at fixed hours of the day to rest a little, to chant psalms standing, and to pray on bent knee. And as he sang thus, without turning his eyes from heaven, he suddenly saw to the right of the hillock on which he stood the semblance of a human body. At first he was confused, thinking he beheld a vision of the devil, and even started with fear. But having guarded himself with the sign of the cross, and banished all fear, he turned his gaze in that direction, and in truth saw some form gliding southwards. It was naked, the skin dark as if burned up by the heat of the sun, and the hair on its head was white as fleece, and not long, falling just below its neck. Zosimus was so overjoyed at beholding a human form that he ran after it in pursuit, but the form fled from him. He followed. At length, when he was near enough to be heard, he shouted, Why do you run from an old man and a sinner, slave of the true God? Wait for me. Whoever you are in God's name, I tell you, for the love of God, for whose sake you are living in the desert. Forgive me for God's sake, but I cannot turn to you and show you my face, Abba Zosimus, for I am a woman and naked as you see with the uncovered shame of my body. But if you would like to fulfill one wish of a sinful woman, throw your cloak so that I can cover my body and can turn to you and ask your blessing. Here terror seized Zosimus, for he heard that she called him by name, but he realized that she could not have done so without knowing anything of him if she had not had the power of spiritual insight. He at once did as he was asked, and he took off his old tattered cloak and threw it to her, turning away as he did so, She picked it up and was able to cover at least a part of her body. Then she turned to Zosimus and said, Why do you wish, Abba Zosimus, to see a sinful woman? What do you wish to hear or learn from me, you who have not shrunk from such great struggles? Zosimus threw himself on the ground and asked for her blessing. She likewise bowed down before him, and thus they lay on the ground prostrate, asking for each other's blessing. And one word alone could be heard from both, Bless me. After a long while, the woman said to Zosimus, Abba Zosimus, it is you who must give blessing and pray. You are dignified with the order of priesthood, and for many years you have been standing up before the holy altar and offering the sacrifice of the divine mysteries. This flung Zosimus into even greater terror. At length with tears, he said to her, O woman, filled with the Spirit, by your mode of life it is evident that you live with God and have died to the world. The grace granted to you is apparent, for you have called me by name and recognized that I am a priest, though you have never seen me before. Grace is recognized not by one's orders, but by gifts of the Spirit, so give me your blessing for God's sake, for I need your prayers. Then giving way before the wish of the elder, the woman said, Blessed is God who cares for the salvation of men and their souls. Zosimus answered, Amen, and both rose to their feet. Then the woman asked the elder, Why have you come, man of God, to me who am so sinful? Why do you wish to see a woman naked and devoid of every virtue? Though I know one thing, the grace of the Holy Spirit has brought you to render me a service in time. Tell me, Father, how are the Christian peoples living and the kings? How is the church guided? Zosimus said, By your prayers, Mother, Christ has granted lasting peace to all, but fulfill the unworthy petition of an old man and pray for the whole world and for me who am a sinner, so that my wanderings in the desert may not be fruitless. She answered, You are a priest, Abba Zosimus. It is you who must pray for me and for all, for this is your calling. But as we must all be obedient, I will gladly do what you ask. And with these words she turned to the east and raised her eyes to heaven, and stretching out her hands she began to pray in a whisper. One could not hear separate words, so Zosimus could not understand anything that she said in her prayers. Meanwhile he stood according to his own word all in a flutter, looking at the ground without saying a word, and he swore, calling God to witness. Then when at length he thought that her prayer was very long, he took his eyes off the ground and saw that she was raised about a forearm's length distance from the ground and stood praying in the air. When he saw this, even greater terror seized him, and he fell on the ground, weeping and repeating many times, Lord, have mercy. And while lying prostrate on the ground, he was tempted by a thought. Is it not a spirit, and perhaps her prayer is hypocrisy? But at the very same moment, the woman turned round, raised the elder from the ground, and said, Why do thoughts confuse you, Abba, and tempt you about me as if I were a spirit and a dissembler in prayer? Know, Holy Father, that I am only a sinful woman, though I am guarded by holy baptism, and I am no spirit but earth and ashes and flesh alone. 
And with these words, she guarded herself with the sign of the cross on her forehead, eyes, mouth, and breast, saying, May God defend us from the evil one and from his designs, for fierce is his struggle against us. Hearing and seeing this, the elder fell to the ground, and embracing her feet, he said with tears, I beg you, by the name of Christ our God, who is born of a virgin, for whose sake you have stripped yourself, for whose sake you have exhausted your flesh, do not hide from your slave who you are and whence and how you came into this desert. Tell me everything so that the marvelous works of God may become known. A hidden wisdom and a secret treasure, what profit is there in them? Tell me all, I implore you. For not out of vanity or for self-display will you speak, but to reveal the truth to me, an unworthy sinner. I believe in God for whom you live and whom you serve. I believe that he led me into this desert so as to show me his ways in regard to you. It is not in our power to resist the plans of God. If it were not the will of God that you and your life would be known, he would not have allowed me to see you and would not have strengthened me to undertake this journey, one like me who never before dared to leave his cell. Much more said Abba Zosimus, but the woman raised him and said, I am ashamed, Abba, to speak to you of my disgraceful life. Forgive me for God's sake, but as you have already seen my naked body, I shall likewise lay bare before you my work, so that you may know with what shame and obscenity my soul is filled. I was not running away out of vanity as you thought, for what have I to be proud of, I who was the chosen vessel of the devil? But when I start my story, you will run from me as from a snake, for your ears will not be able to bear the vileness of my actions. But I shall tell you all without hiding anything, only imploring you first of all to pray incessantly for me, so that I may find mercy on the day of judgment." The elder wept, and the woman began her story. My native land, Holy Father, was Egypt. Already during the lifetime of my parents, when I was 12 years old, I renounced their love and went to Alexandria. I am ashamed to recall how there I at first ruined my maidenhood, and then unrestrainedly and insatiably gave myself up to sensuality. It is more becoming to speak of this briefly, so that you may just know my passion and my lechery. For about 17 years, forgive me, I lived like that. I was a fire of public debauch. And it was not for the sake of gain. Here I speak the pure truth. Often, when they wished to pay me, I refused the money. I acted in this way so as to make as many men as possible try to obtain me, doing free of charge what gave me pleasure. Do not think that I was rich, and that was the reason why I did not take the money. I lived by begging, often by spinning flax, but I had an insatiable desire and an irrepressible passion for lying and filth. This was life to me. Every kind of abuse of nature I regarded as life. That is how I lived. Then one summer I saw a large crowd of Libyans and Egyptians running toward the sea. I asked one of them, Where are these men hurrying to? He replied, They are all going to Jerusalem for the exaltation of the precious and life-giving cross, which takes place in a few days. I said to him, Will they take me with them if I wish to go? No one will hinder you if you have money to pay for the journey and for food. And I said to him, To tell you the truth, I have no money, neither have I food, but I shall go with them and shall go aboard, and they shall feed me, whether they want to or not. I have a body, and they shall take it instead of pay for the journey. I was suddenly filled with a desire to go, Abba, to have more lovers who could satisfy my passion. I told you, Abba Zosimus, not to force me to tell you my disgrace. God is my witness, I am afraid of defiling you in the very air with my words. Zosimus, weeping, replied to her, Speak on for God's sake, mother. Speak and do not break the thread of such an edifying tale. I'll stop for just a second. For those that did come to the church for the, for the pre-sanctified liturgy, remember the cross was set up in the middle of the church and people were making prostrations to it. In the Eastern tradition, the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross is held on that Sunday, as I told you before, on the Sunday during Lent. And so this is the exact feast day that she's talking about. Okay. And resuming her story, she went on. That youth, on hearing my shameless words, laughed and went off, while I, throwing away my spinning wheel, ran off towards the sea in the direction which everyone seemed to be taking, and seeing some young men standing on the shore, about ten or more of them, full of vigor and alert in their movements, I decided that they would do for my purposes. It seemed that some of them were waiting for more travelers, while others had gone ashore. Shamelessly as usual, I mixed with the crowd, saying, Take me with you to the place you are going to you will not find me superfluous. I also added a few more words, calling forth general laughter. Seeing my readiness to be shameless, they readily took me aboard the boat. Those who were expected came also, and we set sail at once. 
How shall I relate to you what happened after this? Whose tongue can tell? Whose ears can take in all that took place on the boat during that voyage? And to all this I frequently forced those miserable youths even against their own will. There is no mentionable or unmentionable depravity of which I was not their teacher. I am amazed, Abba, how the sea stood our licentiousness, how the earth did not open its jaws, and how it was that hell did not swallow me alive when I had entangled in my net so many souls. But I think God was seeking my repentance, for he does not desire the death of a sinner, but magnanimously awaits his return to him. At last we arrived in Jerusalem. I spent the days before the festival in the town, living the, the same kind of life, perhaps even worse. I was not content with the youths I had seduced at sea and who had helped me get to Jerusalem. Many other citizens of the town and foreigners I also seduced. The holy day of the exaltation of the Holy Cross dawned while I was still flying about, hunting for youths. At daybreak, I saw that everyone was hurrying to the church, so I ran with the rest. When the hour for the holy elevation approached, I was trying to make my way with the crowd, which was struggling to get through the church doors. I at last squeezed through with great difficulty, almost to the entrance of the temple, from which the life-giving tree of the cross was being shown to the people. But when I trod on the doorstep, which everyone passed, I was stopped by some force which prevented my entering. Meanwhile, I was brushed aside by the crowd and found myself standing alone in the porch. Thinking that this had happened because of my woman's weakness, I began to work my way into the crowd, trying to elbow myself forward. But in vain I struggled. Again, my feet trod on the doorstep over which others were entering the church without encountering any obstacle. I alone seemed to remain unaccepted by the church. It was as if there was a detachment of soldiers standing there to oppose my entrance. Once again, I was excluded by the same mighty force, and again I stood in the porch. Having repeated my attempt three or four times, at last I felt exhausted and had no more strength to push and to be pushed, so I went aside and stood in a corner of the porch, and only then, with great difficulty, it began to dawn on me, and I began to understand the reason why I was prevented from being admitted to see the life-giving cross. The word of salvation gently touched the eyes of my heart and, I, and revealed to me that it was my unclean life which barred the entrance to me. I began to weep and lament and beat my breast and to sigh with the depths of my heart. And so I stood weeping when I saw above me the icon of the Holy Mother of God and turning to her my bodily and spiritual eyes, I said, O Lady Mother of God who gave birth in the flesh to God the Word, I know how well I know that it is no honor or praise to thee when one so impure and depraved as I look upon thy icon. O ever virgin who didst keep thy body and soul in purity, rightly do I inspire hatred and disgust before thy virginal purity. But I have heard that God who was born of thee became man on purpose to call sinners to repentance. Then help me, for I have no other help. Order the entrance of the church to be open to me. Allow me to see the venerable tree on which he who was born of thee suffered in the flesh, on which he shed his holy blood for the redemption of sinners and for me, unworthy as I am. Be my faithful witness before thy son, that I will never again defile my body by the impurity of fornication. But as soon as I have seen the tree of the cross, I will renounce the world and its temptation and will go wherever thou wilt lead me. Thus I spoke, and as if acquiring some hope and firm faith and feeling some confidence in the mercy of God, I left the place where I stood praying. And I went again and mingled with the crowd that was pushing its way into the temple. And no one seemed to thwart me. No one hindered my entering the church. I was possessed with trembling, was almost in delirium, having got as far as the doors which I could not reach before. As if the same force which had hindered me cleared the way before me, I now entered without difficulty and found myself within the holy place. And so it was I saw the life-giving cross. I saw too the mysteries of God and how the Lord accepts repentance. Throwing myself on the ground, I worshipped that holy earth and kissed it and with trembling. Then I came out of the church and went to her who had promised to be my security, to the place where I had sealed my vow, and bending my knees before the Virgin Mother of God, I addressed to her such words as these. O loving lady, thou hast shown me thy great love for all men. Glory to God who receives the repentance of sinners through thee. What more can I recollect or say, I who am so sinful? It is time for me, O lady, to fulfill my vow according to thy witness. Now lead me by the hand along the path of repentance. And at these words I heard a voice from on high. If you cross the Jordan, you will find glorious rest. Hearing this voice and having faith that it was for me, I cried to the mother of God, O oh, lady, lady, do not forsake me. With these words I left the porch of the church and set off on my journey. 
As I was leaving the church, a stranger glanced at me and gave me three coins, saying, Sister, take these. And taking the money, I bought three loaves and took them with me on my journey as a blessed gift. I asked the person who sold the bread, which is the way to the Jordan, and I was directed to the city gate, which led that way. Running on, I passed the gates and still weeping went on my journey. Those I met, I asked the way, and after walking for the rest of that day, I think it was about was nine o'clock when I saw the cross. I at length reached at sunset the church of St. John the Baptist, which stood on the banks of the Jordan. After praying in the temple, I went down to the Jordan, rinsed my face and hands in the holy waters. I partook of the holy and life-giving mysteries in the church of the forerunner and ate half of one of my loaves. Then after drinking some water from the Jordan, I lay down and passed the night on the ground. In the morning, I found a small boat and crossed to the opposite bank. I again prayed to Our Lady to lead me whither she wished. Then I found myself in this desert. And since then, up to this very day, I am estranged from all, keeping away from people and running away from everyone. And I live here clinging to my God, who saves all who turn to him from faint-heartedness and storms. Zosimus asked her, How many years have gone by since you began to live in this desert? She replied, Forty-seven years have already gone by, I think, since I left the holy city. Zosimus asked, By what food do you find? And the woman said, I had two and a half loaves when I crossed the Jordan. Soon they dried up and became hard as rock. Eating a little, I gradually finished them after a few years. Zosimus asked, Can it be that without getting ill you have lived so many years thus, without suffering in any way from such a complete change? The woman answered, You remind me, Zosimus, of what I dare not speak of, for when I recall all the dangers which I overcame and all the violent thoughts which confused me, I am again afraid that they will take possession of me. Zosimus said, Do not hide from me anything. Speak to me without concealing anything. And she said to him, Believe me, Abba, seventeen years I passed in this desert fighting wild beasts, mad desires, and passions. When I was about to partake of food, I used to begin to regret the meat and fish which, of which I had so much in Egypt. I regretted also not having wine, which I loved so much, for I drank a lot of wine when I lived in the world. While here I had not even water. I used to burn and succumb with thirst, and the mad desire for profligate songs also entered me and confused me greatly edging me on to sing satanic songs which I had learned once. But when such desires entered me, I struck myself on the breast and reminded myself of the vow which I had made when going into the desert. In my thoughts, I returned to the icon of the Mother of God, which had received me. And to her I cried in prayer. I implored her to chase away the thoughts to which my miserable soul was succumbing. And after weeping for long and beating my breast, I used to see light at last, which seemed to shine on me from everywhere. And after the violent storm, lasting calm descended. And how can I tell you about the thoughts which urged me on to fornication? How can I express them to you, Abba? A fire was kindled in my miserable heart which seemed to burn me up completely and to awaken me a thirst for embraces. And as soon as this craving came to me, I flung myself to the earth and watered it with my tears as if I saw before me my witness who had appeared to me in my disobedience and who seemed to threaten punishment for the crime. And I did not rise from the ground. Sometimes I lay prostrate for a day and a night until a calm and sweet light descended and enlightened me and chastened me and chased away the thoughts that possessed me. But always I turned my eyes of my mind to my protectress, asking her to extend help to one who was sinking fast in the waves of the desert. And I always had her as my help and the acceptor of my repentance. And thus I lived for 17 years amid the constant dangers and since then, even till now, the mother of God helps me in everything and leads me, as it were, by the hand. Zosimus asked, Can it be that you did not need food and clothing? She answered, After finishing the loaves I had and of which I spoke, for seventeen years I have fed on herbs and all that can be found in the desert. The clothes I had when I crossed the Jordan became torn and worn. I suffered greatly from cold and greatly from the extreme heat. At times the sun burned me up, and at other times I shivered from frost, and frequently falling on the ground, I lay without breath and without motion. I struggled with many afflictions and with terrible temptations, but from that time till now the power of God in numerous ways has guarded my sinful soul and my humble body. When I only reflect on the evils from which the Lord has delivered me, I have imperishable food for hope of salvation. I am fed and clothed by the all-powerful word of God, the Lord of all, for it is not by bread alone that man lives, and those who have stripped off the rags of skin have no refuge, hiding themselves in the clefts of the rocks. Hearing that she w cited words of scripture from Moses and Job, Zosimus asked her, And so you have read the Psalms and other books? And she smiled at this and said to the elder, 
Believe me, I have not seen a human face ever since I crossed the Jordan, except yours today. I have not seen a beast or a living being even since I came into the desert. I never learned from books. I have never even heard anyone who sang and re read from them. But the word of God, which is alive and active, by itself teaches a man knowledge. And so this is the end of my tale. But as I asked you in the beginning, so even now I implore you for the sake of the incarnate word of God to pray to the Lord for me who am such a sinner. Thus concluding her tale, she bowed down before him, and with tears the elder exclaimed, Blessed is God who creates the great and wondrous, the glorious and marvelous without end. Blessed is God who has shown me how he rewards those who fear him. Truly, O Lord, thou dost not forsake those who seek thee. And the woman, not allowing the elder to bow down before her, said, I beg you, Holy Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, tell no one what you have heard until God delivers me from this earth. And now depart in peace, and again, next year you shall see me, and I you, if God will preserve us in his great mercy. But for God's sake, do as I ask you. Next year during Lent, do not cross the Jordan as is your custom in the monastery. Zosimus was amazed to hear that she knew the rules of the monastery and could only say, Glory to God, who bestows great gifts on those who love him. She continued, Remain, Abba, in the monastery, and even if you wish to depart, you will not be able to do so. And at sunset, on the holy day of the Last Supper, put some of the life-giving body and blood of Christ into a holy vessel, worthy to hold such mysteries for me, and bring it, and wait for me on the banks of the Jordan, adjoining the inhabited parts of the land, so that I can come and partake of the life-giving gifts. For since the time I communicated in the temple of the forerunner before crossing the Jordan, even to this day I have not approached the holy mysteries, and I thirst for them with an irrepressible love and longing. And therefore I ask and implore you to grant me my wish, bring me the life-giving mysteries at the very hour when our Lord made his disciples partake of the divine supper. Tell John, the abbot of the monastery where you live, look to yourself and to your brothers, for there is much that needs correction. Only do not say this now, but when God guides you, pray for me. With these words she vanished into the depths of the desert, and Zosimus, falling down on his knees and bowing down to the ground on which she had stood, sent up glory and thanks to God. And after wandering throughout the desert, he returned to the monastery on the day all the brothers returned. For the whole year he kept silent, not daring to tell anyone of what he had seen. But in his soul he prayed to God to give him another chance of seeing the ascetic's dear face. And when at length the first Sunday of the great fast came, all went out into the desert with the customary prayers and singing the psalms. Only Zosimus was held back by illness. He lay in a fever, and then he remembered what the saint had said. Even if you wish to depart, you will not be able to do so. Many days passed, and at last, recovering from his illness, he remained in the monastery. And when the monks returned in the day of the Last Supper dawned, he did as he had been ordered, and placing some of the most pure body and blood into a small chalice, and putting some figs and dates and lentils soaked in water into a small basket, he departed for the desert and reached the banks of the Jordan and sat down to wait for the saint. He waited for a long while, and then doubt began to set in. Then raising his eyes to heaven, he began to pray. Grant me, O Lord, to behold that which thou hast allowed to me to behold once. Do not let me depart in vain, being the burden of my sins. And then another thought struck him. And what if she does come? There is no boat. How will she cross the Jordan to come to me, who am so unworthy? As he was pondering thus, he saw the holy woman appear and stand on the other side of the river. Zosimus got up, rejoicing and glorifying and thanking God, and again the thought came to him that she could not cross the Jordan. Then he saw that she made the sign of the cross over the waters of the Jordan, and the night was a moonlit one, as he related afterwards. And then she at once stepped on the, to the water and began walking across the surface toward him. And when he wanted to prostrate himself, she cried to him while still walking on the water, What are you doing, Abba? You are a priest in carrying the divine gifts. He obeyed her, and on reaching the shore, she said to the elder, Bless, Father, bless me. He answered her trembling, for a state of confusion had overcome him at the sight of the miracle. Truly, God did not lie when he promised that when we purify ourselves, we shall be like him. Glory to thee, Christ our God, who has shown me through thy slave how far away I stand from perfection. Here the woman asked him to say the creed in the Our Father. He began, she finished the prayer, and according to the custom of that time, gave him the kiss of peace on the lips. Having partaken of the holy mysteries, she raised her hands to heaven and sighed with tears in her eyes, exclaiming, Now let us thy servant depart in peace, O Lord, according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. 
Then she said to the elder, Forgive me, Abba, for asking you, but fulfill another wish of mine. Go now to the monastery and let God's grace guard you, and next year come again to the same place where I first met you. Come for God's sake, for you shall again see me, for such is the will of God. He said to her, From this day on I would like to follow you and always see your holy face, but now fulfill the one and only wish of an old man and take a little food I have brought for you. And he showed her the basket while she touched the lentils with the tips of her fingers, and taking three grains, said that the Holy Spirit guards the substance of the soul unpolluted. Then she said, Pray, for God's sake, pray for me, and remember a miserable wretch. Touching the saint's feet and asking for her prayers for the church, the kingdom, and himself, he let her depart with tears while he went off sighing and sorrowful, for he could not hope to vanquish the invincible. Meanwhile, she again made the sign of the cross over the Jordan and stepped on the water and crossed over as before. And the elder returned filled with joy and terror, accusing himself of not having asked the saint her name, but he decided to do so next year. And when another year had passed, he again went into the desert. He reached the same spot, but could see no sign of anyone. So raising his eyes to heaven as before, he prayed, Show me, O Lord, thy pure treasure, which thou hast concealed in the desert. Show me, I pray thee, the angel in the flesh, of which the world is not worthy. Then on the opposite bank of the river, her face turned toward the rising sun, he saw the saint lying dead. Her hands were crossed according to custom, and her face was turned to the east, Running up, he shed tears over the saint's feet and kissed them, not daring to touch anything else. For a long time he wept, then reciting the appropriate psalm, he said the burial prayers and thought to himself, Must I bury the body of a saint, or will this be contrary to her wishes? And then he saw the words traced on the ground by her head, Abba Zosi must bury on this spot the body of humble Mary. Return to dust that which is dust, and pray to the Lord for me, who departed in the month of Firmatin of Egypt, called April by the Romans, on the first day, on the very night of our Lord's Passion, after having partaken of the divine mysteries. Reading this, the elder was glad to know the saint's name. He understood, too, that as soon as she had partaken of the divine mysteries on the shore of the Jordan, she was at once transported to the place where she died, the distance which Zosimus had taken twenty days to cover. Mary had evidently traversed in an hour, and had at once surrendered her soul to God. Then Zosimus thought, it is time to do as she wished, but how am I to dig a grave with nothing in my hands? And then he saw nearby a small piece of wood left by some traveler in the desert. Picking it up, he began to dig the ground, but the earth was hard and dry and did not yield to the efforts of the elder. He grew tired and covered with sweat. He sighed from the depths of his soul, and lifting up his eyes, he saw a big lion standing close to the saint's body and licking her feet. At the sight of the lion, he trembled with fear, especially when he called to mind Mary's word that she had never seen wild beasts in the desert. But guarding himself with the sign of the cross, the thought came to him that the power of the one lying there would protect him and keep him unharmed. Meanwhile, the lion drew nearer to him, expressing affection by every movement. Zosimus said to the lion, The great one ordered that her body was to be buried, but I am old and have not strength to dig the grave. For I have no spade, and it would take too long to go and get one. So can you carry out the work with your claws? Then we can commit to the earth the mortal temple of the saint. While he was still speaking, the lion with his front paws began to dig a hole deep enough to bury the body. Again the elder washed the feet of the saint with his tears, and calling on her to pray for all, covered the body with earth in the presence of the lion. It was as it had been, naked and uncovered by anything but the tattered cloak which had been given to her by Zosimus, and with which Mary, turning away, had managed to cover part of her body. Then both departed. The lion went off into the depth of the desert like a lamb, while Zosimus returned to the monastery, glorifying and blessing Christ our God. And on reaching the monastery, he told all the brothers about everything, and all marveled on hearing of God's miracles. And with fear and love, they kept the memory of the saint." Abba John, as St. Mary had previously told Abba Zosimus, found a number of things wrong in the monastery and got rid of them with God's help. And Zosimus died in the same monastery, almost attaining the age of a hundred and passed to eternal life. The monks kept this story without writing it down and passed it on by word of mouth to one another. But I, add St. Sophronius, as soon as I heard it, wrote it down. Perhaps someone else better informed has already written the life of the saint, but as far as I could, I have recorded everything putting truth above all else. May God, who works amazing miracles and generously bestows gifts on those who turn to him with faith, reward those who seek light for themselves in this story, 
who hear, read, and are zealous to write it. And may he grant them the lot of blessed Mary, together with all who at different times have pleased God by their pious thoughts and labors. And let us also give glory to God, the eternal King, that he may grant us to his mercy in the day of judgment, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom belongs all glory, honor, and dominion, adoration, with the eternal Father and the most holy and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Take a quick break, have a few of the things Mary of Egypt would have eaten, and, uh, and we'll come back together in about three minutes. I'm sorry the text was so long. I'll just let you know next week, of course, I'm not going to be doing any reading to you except from the scriptures because we're going to have a Bible study on Mary Magdalene. Um, so it will not, it will kind of change our, our, our program here. I appreciate you guys coming these last three weeks, even though these texts have been long. They're, uh, they're just, they're gems and they're, they're things I couldn't, I couldn't comment on Mary of Egypt without reading the text because it just, how could you, okay? Um, and uh, you'll, you'll notice April 1st, I believe in the, in the Roman church also, um, her feast day is still held on April 1st. It is in the east, and if it's not on April 1st, it's right around that date. So you'll see that coming up in the calendar, um, especially if you're attending daily mass. Okay, as usual, I want to just a couple, we spend about f 10 minutes max, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, just getting a sense from you guys also, I want to make some comments. So do you have any comments about the text, the story itself, things that strike you? I mean, well, not everything that strikes you, but okay. It says on the last page she died in 525 A.D. Right. Is, which date is correct? Yeah, um, it's, it, that's added to the text there, and it's, I mean, look, the dates are, all of these dates are under debate, okay? And some people will date it one way or the other based upon the life of St. Sophronius and how you hold his dates, which we hold based upon the dates of the Emperor Heraclius, who he welcomed. So, I mean, these things are under question, okay? Someone like Mary of Egypt, I mean, how are you going to know when she was born, okay, when she died? So, these are, we have based these things. Eusebius um, gives us some indication, but again, there's debate. I was very, very struck by the reading. I found it very beautiful. It made me cry. Two things. What does it mean when she says... She's talking about the conversion when she finally enters the church, and she says, I saw, too, the mysteries of God and how the Lord accepts repentance. I was just wondering what was going on there. Any thoughts or comments on that? What are the mysteries of God? The sacraments. The word sacrament means mystery. She beheld the mysteries of God, okay? And so she came into the church, apparently, and, uh, and conf confessing her sins. Um, and receiving the holy mysteries. It's important, this text, as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, stretches our common, in a sense, conceptions and, um, and, and structures a little bit, okay? Um, but there it is, the holy mysteries. Are there any uh, churches or sacred places dedicated to this saint? Yeah, there's a chapel in the Church of the Holy Resurrection. How many of you have been to Jerusalem? There's a chapel in the, in, the, uh, in the Church of the Holy Resurrection dedicated to her. Um, if you, sorry to be constantly referring back to our trip over on Wednesday, but there was a reason why we went there, so that we could read this text and you have a little bit of context for it. But if you remember, when you come into the church, there's an icon in the entryway of the Mother of God with her arms extended. This was the icon, not the icon, but a, 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 a replication of the icon that Mary of Egypt beheld as she entered in the church. So there, when we come into the church, we stand like Mary of Egypt, okay, and is confessing our sins, and then enter into the holy place. Uh, also, um, in, I'm sure there are other places dedicated to her memory, um, but uh, when I was in Spain, in the church uh, uh, in Burgos, in the Cathedral of Burgos, her statue was there in one of the side altars in this, I mean, you know those old churches with the, there was tons of statues, I saw this one, and you just... It just struck me, and it had to be Mary of Egypt, and I did a little research, and sure enough, it was. I was just going to say, it's uh, kind of interesting that she comes out of Egypt, almost like the, uh, um, the Israelites, and then goes out into the desert for a long period, and then, but she completes and does the New Testament, too, so, mm -hmm. so it comes all full circle. Yeah, yeah, good comment. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, usually, Melanie, we don't allow two questions. <laughs> I know. Okay. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. She talks to Abba Zosimus and says, and at sunset of the holy day of the Last Supper, put some of the life-giving body and blood of Christ into a holy vessel, so on and so on. Does that mean, that, is that um, Good Friday, and does that mean that they were celebrating the Eucharist on Good Friday? No, and the, it, it says the, of the yeah, Lord's Supper, right? Was this yeah, okay, of the Last again. Supper. Yeah. And at sunset of the holy day of the sunset, Last Supper. Yeah, so it's sunsetting, like we normally do on the day of the Last Supper on Thursday. On Thursday, yes, exactly. Okay. I have a couple of comments, and I also, if you have any others, I'd love to, to get them. But um, notice that she turns to the east to pray. Remember that? Okay, it said it a couple of times in the text. We also read that in the text of St. Polycarp. Okay, it was also mentioned in the letter of Pliny the Younger to Trajan that they came, he says, he's trying to give an account of the Christians, and he says, they gather, the only thing I figure, they gather before sunset. I'm sorry, before sunrise, I'm sorry. Before sunrise, what's what's going on here? They know which way to face. Say it again. They know which way to face. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, the sun comes up in the east, yes. so they're going to face the east. Why? That's where Jerusalem was. Uh, now, but what if you're in in China? <laughs> um, I believe that that. Salvation is coming from the east. The Savior will return. You remember our Lord's words that this, the second coming would happen at like lightning shining from the east to the west. Okay, God is called the Orient from on high. There's these little indications in Scripture, also in the Gospel of John. Uh, the, um, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. Right? And who is the light? But is Christ. The early Christians always, always, always prayed facing the east in preparation for the second coming, so that as they are worshiping God, as the second coming takes place, they behold it coming out of the east. Okay, they took this very seriously. All churches, every church, was built facing east. And if there was a reason, for example, the Vatican, uh, St. Peter's in Rome, is built quite the opposite for good reason. And the liturgy was celebrated in that church facing the people, but... During the Eucharistic liturgy, the people would turn, believe it or not, turn their back upon the altar. The doors of the church would be opened, and they would prostrate facing east. Never in the history of Christendom, from day one up until the Protestant Revolution, was the worship of Christians ever done facing the people. It was always done facing the east. This was the primary thing. If you go, if you go to ancient churches, pull out a compass. I used to hold, I used to take one with me. And I'd walk into a church and I'd pull it out. And sure enough, all the old churches of Europe, if you go to the Holy Land, same thing. Always, always facing east. Doesn't matter where the road is to show off the church. Not at all. Always facing east. Why? Because we are worshiping him who is to come again, who is the salvation of our souls. Those of the older generation that are here will remember the old days, which is now becoming fashionable again, where the priest would stand at the altar with his back to you. Do you remember that? Guess what? No priest in the history of Christendom has ever celebrated the liturgy with his back to you. He celebrated it with his face toward Christ. With you. He doesn't have his back to you any more than you have your back to the person in the pew behind you. We are, in a sense, the army of God marching on towards salvation. And he, in humility, faces with us as one of the members of the army, leading the charge towards paradise to come. And so this, this concept of, of, well, in the old days, uh, the old church, you know, they hated the people, they turned their back on the people, nonsense. I bring that up only because our current Holy Father has written quite a bit on this. And I believe that within many of our lifetime, this will become, again, the proper way for the priest to pray in the church. And I would also encourage you in your homes, find the eastern wall of your house, put a cross there, and that's where you say your night prayers. This is the ancient custom of the church, always reminding ourselves that we're preparing ourselves for something beyond us. Okay? And as the Holy Father says, otherwise, when we face each other, we become worshipers of each other. And the circle is enclosed upon ourselves. 
such a trend with modern society, isn't it? Quick question for you. What is the purpose of fasting? What is the purpose of fasting? Mary of Egypt takes a very serious fast here, doesn't she? Okay. But we also are in the midst of a fast. Okay. What is the purpose of fasting? To keep the longing of our Lord in our heart. Okay. To keep the longing of the Lord in our heart, yes. To purify your soul and mind. To purify your soul and mind, okay. To do penance for your sins. To do penance for your sins, okay. To discipline yourself. Any others? For, to have more time for prayer. Okay. Okay. These are all, yeah, okay. Good. Man does not live by bread alone. Yeah, all of these things have some truth in them, but they also, in some sense, I would say, can, can get a little confusing. Does God want us to suffer? No. Is food bad? No. In fact, God made it for us. But there is a right order in man and a right order in creation. And man is about more than simply the body. Okay, we have a higher faculty called the soul. And it's our intellect and will that is made by God to rule the body, to control it. And yet, throughout the year, it's, it seems, because of the fall, it is so easy for us to slip into a situation where the demands of the body become the primary driving force in our lives. I'm hungry, I eat. I want to have a good time, I go to a party. I'm bored, I watch a movie. Constantly, constantly trying to satisfy that with things which are ultimately never going to satisfy us. And so the church in her wisdom, and the Jews in their wisdom, fasted. Our Lord told us that when He ascended to heaven, His followers would also fast. Why? So that we could regain that intellectual superiority of the, the right order in our bodies, the right order in our souls, so that we could journey with Christ to the cross. And that on the day of the crucifixion, when He stands before the cross and willingly dies for us, we too might say, Yes, Lord, I willingly die with You because there is not one person in this room or in this world who will ever rise from the dead who has not first died. We must get to the point where we willingly, with Christ, die with Him to those desires which are controlling us so that we can say, Yes, Lord, I want You and I want true life. And only then will the food we eat and the entertainment we use, and all the goods of the created order before our salvation instead of a deterrent from our salvation. One more thing about the fast. In the West and in the East, two different approaches are taken, both of them valuable. In the West, law has always taken a minimalist approach, saying, at least you have to do these things. In a sense, the, the law is a guardrail for those that are about to fall off the body of Christ. At least you have to go to church on Sunday. At least you have to receive Holy Communion once a year. At least you have to fast on uh, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. At least. If you don't do those things, you're not in communion with Jesus Christ and you will die. That's called mortal sin. Being outside of Christ. The East has taken the opposite approach. Um, in a sense, a maximalist approach. Always placing the monastic fast, if we're talking about fasting or law, before us. Saying, there's the goal. Struggle to attain it. Now, most of us in this room are Roman Catholic. I'm an Eastern Catholic or, or Melkite Catholic. I would say to the Roman Catholics in this room, be careful that the minimum law doesn't become your maximum. It doesn't become the goal. Because if it's the goal, you're not in the heart of the body of Christ. You're the, uh, uh, the hangnail. Okay? Yeah. If you at least go to church on Sunday and at least fast, fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, my friends, you're not living. You're not living. I want to encourage you, over these next couple of weeks that we have before us, start to live. Take seriously the fast that the church sets before us, both east and west. The church says, don't eat meat on Friday. Don't eat meat during Lent. 
Turn off the televisions and the radios. Take seriously the time that you have before you because if you do, then when Christ rises from the dead, you too will also rise from the dead. The problem with the world, the reason why on Easter Sunday they got a bunny jumping around is because they missed the resurrection. And they had to fill it in with something else because they did not prepare themselves properly to be crucified with Christ, that they might also rise with Him. The mercy of God knows no end. But while we are given the gifts that God has given us, we better make use of them. I'm not going to count on, you know, Constantine the Great waited to the, his last few hours to be baptized. Don't wait. It's time to prepare now. And a final thought on that same, that same line. Mary of Egypt didn't attend Sunday liturgy, did she? <laughs> First of all, the church didn't have laws like that, that you have to do this, do that. Yeah, but it stretches the edges of our common conceptions a bit. And I ask you, what is the point of the liturgy? What is the goal of the Mass? What is the point of our Sunday obligation? It's communion with God. That's the goal. And when that goal is reached and participated in, all things, law itself, falls away. I had a lady ask me in one of our talks, well, doesn't this seem kind of Jewish, all these laws? And, you kind of, and I said, yeah, it does. And it does because these laws are set for those that are about to die. They're about to fall out of communion with Jesus Christ. The goal is the love of God and participation in his life. For those of us that are here and have access to the holy mysteries, then yes, Sunday and more. But Mary of Egypt entered into a communion which I dare say not one of us has even begun to see. And she passed beyond those limits and entered into something much more important. So again, we're challenged. These last few days, begin now to prepare yourself as though it was Ash Wednesday. Tighten that belt and get to work. Go home tonight and pray about it. How do I spend the next few weeks that I could stand at the crucifixion and say, yes, Lord, I willingly die with you. I will no longer live for myself, but only for you. And only then will we rise from the dead with him. Next week, same time, same place, uh, Mary Magdalene, bring your Bibles. And please, bring a friend. This is not because I'm teaching it, but this is some good stuff I got. I mean, oh, <laughs> I'm telling you. Let's stand and conclude in prayer. My wife and I and Melanie are going to sing you the proper hymn for uh, Mary of Egypt. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In you, O Mother Mary, was restored the likeness of God. For you carried your cross and followed Christ. You taught by your deeds how to spurn the body, for it passes away, and how to value the soul, for it is immortal. Wherefore your soul is forever in happiness with the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.